You're listening to Veg Your Best. There has never been a more important time to be vegan. At Veg Your Best, I want to help you. I want to help you limit and eliminate the consumption of animal products without feeling deprived, overwhelmed, or unsupported, even if no one you know is vegan. My name's Michelle Olander. I'm a life coach. And I know that if I could go vegan in my 50s, With all my excuses, I know you can start moving in that direction too. Veg your best, and there's nothing you can't do. Episode 190, warning, may contain confusing information. Reading labels, choosing vegan, and hummingbirds. my veg your bestie. Thank you for being here. Thanks for coming back here. You know, I hope, I hope you, at least you in the United States, I hope you got through your tax day preparations more or less unscathed and without any big shocks or adrenaline rushes. And now I know you don't tune in here to veg your best. I know you don't follow me on Instagram for my effortless organizational skills, but I'm turning 65 in June and I have learned a couple of things that I really do recommend. And number one, I don't know, maybe you've heard of this. It's a calendar. The calendar is your friend. (laughs) And if you stay in one place most of the time, a paper wall calendar is good. But if you tend to be all over the place, a little bit more like me, the digital calendar on your phone is probably a lot better. But I use both because uh, if I'm planning whether, well, planning for the year or even the week, I get a better sense of time and the spaces between events and what I still have room for if I look at my calendar in a physical paper format. The larger, the better. But for long range planning, honest to God, there's nothing like this calendar that you're toting around all day in your phone. You can just put a reminder on that thing. I press the home button and I say, create event. February 15, 2025, call bank about 1099 tax form. Boom. (laughs) Okay, so if there's anything in this immediate post-tax day period, if there's anything fresh on your mind right now, something you know you forgot to do for your tax preparation and took a bunch of time at the last minute or something that took a lot longer than you expected, or questions you know you're going to need answers to before you do your taxes next year, this right now, this second, this would be a great day, great moment, even to put it on uh, put it on your digital calendar since you probably do not have your 2025 paper wall calendar yet. So put it on that digital calendar. Pick a date, maybe February, maybe January, maybe April 1, whatever you want. Put, put it on your digital calendar to remind you to get that information or ask those questions or uh, to remind your spouse or business partner something, a question that would have streamlined this year's tax preparation experience. Put it on your calendar, okay? I will tell you what added a bunch of unexpected time to my tax prep this, this year was that banks and companies, did you know this? you will know it soon if you haven't run into it lately. They sometimes just lock you out of the login process without really telling you what's wrong if you haven't logged in for a while. And you have to go and change your password with a customer service rep, which is, you know, I don't know. Are you capable of thinking of brand new passwords right there in the moment while a customer service representative is uh, thumbing the desk? (laughs) I can't do it. Is that just me? Anyway, I got through it and you might just put it on your calendar, which I did to log into those accounts at some point before the big rush for my taxes so that I know my my uh, my passwords up to date. You know, they've changed some of them now. They used to be eight eight characters um, with certain certain requirements. Now some of them are 12 on my bank account. So anyway, just just a little organizational tax prep tip from 
your friendly vegan podcaster. So I just want you to know it's this is a safe space for people who are not 100% perfect at things, okay? If you're like me and you're not super organized and intentional and you have password apps and, uh, you know, confused cross-references, it's okay and you can still have a productive, happy life, okay? But now, in the last couple of weeks that I've been running around, uh, I've been on the road a little bit. We've been getting ready to leave my Florida family where I've been for four months and get back to my life in Western Massachusetts. And in all that running around, I was a couple of times organizing some road snacks at the convenience store after getting gas. And as I went rifling through the snack bags, looking for snacks that don't contain any, obviously meat, dairy, eggs, or fish, I was noticing a few that have none of those ingredients on the listed ingredients, but then say, may contain milk or may contain eggs. And as you know, I thought I knew what that meant, (laughs) but I wasn't positive. So I'm like, okay, well, this would be the time to look into it. I decided to check and uh, share on the podcast what I learned, how I went about it. And you know, the too long didn't read for this for this uh, episode is it was more complicated than I thought it was. It was more complicated than I thought it would be. And I don't want you to let that be an issue. Okay. Whether you're new to plant-based, whether you're new to making vegan choices or you've been doing it a while, the details, the specifics They'll always change. There'll be always new things coming up and issues that you didn't think about. Things you thought you know will often end up being out of date or incomplete or out of context. So please do not let any details that we talk about today, do not let fine tuning your vegan journey distract you from the big choices, the main intention of limiting or eliminating the consumption of animals and their products. Okay, that's the summary. Here's where it gets more confusing for me at least. So in said convenience store on the road after getting gas, I was rifling through the chips area. I picked up a bag of popcorners. Popcorners, kettle corn flavor. Now they used to give out that snack on JetBlue uh, at a point where they, they had previously offered Terra chips, the blue potato Terra chips, which I loved. And then they discontinued that and they got these popcorners, kettle corn flavor chips. And uh, is this too much detail? <laughs> Are you judging me? Anyway, on the package of those uh, popcorners, the Terra chips had been vegans, at least as far as I knew. Um, the popcorners on the package, it said, may contain milk. But there was nothing like milk on the ingredients list. In fact, it was a one of those fairly short ingredients lists, which typically you want to see. Kettle corn popcorners bag said yellow corn, sunflower oil, cane sugar, sea salt. And then below, it said may contain milk. So, I remember the first time I read that on the package, I was disappointed and decided not to eat them. And then a few times later, I did a quick Google search on that phrase, may contain, may contain. And I learned that in the United States, this terminology, this voluntary uh, statement on packaging was in response to the 2006 Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act, FALCPA, FALCPA. <laughs> anyway, it's always, I always see it listed FALCPA, but that's the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act. And that required a disclosure of any allergens in the ingredients of food products. So, by law, most food production companies. Uh, are required to identify specifically and in writing on the package if a product contains 
one of the listed eight common food allergens. Milk, egg, fish, crustacean shellfish, tree nuts, wheat, peanuts, and soybeans. I think that's eight. Milk, egg, fish, crustacean shellfish, tree nuts, wheat, peanuts, and soybeans. So those are the eight very common food allergens and the FALCPA, Food Allergen Labeling Consumer Protection Act, uh, of the FDA required disclosure on packaged food products. But the labels um, on those food products did not have to state whether a product or the product in the bag, in the, pro- in the packaging, might have inadvertently come into some contact with one of those allergens during the production process. So, hence the creation of these may contain statements, which as far as I understand, as of today, these are completely voluntary statements. They aren't even a recommendation made to uh, food companies from the FDA, but they're there as an, uh, to act as a warning uh, from the manufacturer that there could be some degree of cross-contamination possible, and that could be through machinery or storage or the packaging facilities, or even during transportation. There could be some sort of cross-contamination with one of those allergens. Super important when individuals are at any kind of risk of anaphylactic shock in response to one of those food allergens, but also super helpful to those with less life-threatening and still unpleasant reactions. So it's important to know that the phrase may be may contain. Or it may be something like, um, well, other phrases you could see, made on shared equipment with, or produced in the same facility as, may contain traces of, or manufactured in the same facility as products containing certain statements like this. They're all a little bit different, but it's important to understand that a may contain statement does not indicate any different level of risk of contamination than a may contain traces of or produced in the same facility as. These are completely, um, these are statements. They're not legal language. They are not scientifically garnered. They are not any kind of guidance from the FDA about your health. They are, rather than FDA, they're more in that category of CYA, um, otherwise known as cover your assets language. There's no legal threshold of the amounts or traces um, of these cross-contaminant possibilities. And these statements are done voluntarily by the food manufacturing company itself. And it may not be based on any Uh, any real probability of the accidental cross-contamination possible. So, okay. And honestly, if you're listening to this in the future, the FDA may have already offered more guidance on allergen labeling, um, but as I understand, it would first have to require establishing allergen thresholds, um, and that's not easy to establish what threshold of um, an allergen trace is considered safe for all or almost all allergic individuals. And that's not as straightforward, apparently, as it sounds. So if you or someone you feed or shop for is deathly allergic or even just mildly allergic, nothing I'm saying about allergies, you should not listen to me. (laughs) Listen to your physician. Listen to the science. Also, this information changes from time to time based on uh, federal standards and science. So I'm just trying to share with you how I evaluate the messages on packaging when I'm looking at processed food. So the may contain message was uh, what, what got my attention on the, pop, the popcorners. So if there's no meat, fish, eggs, dairy on the label, and yes, I also avoid honey because why not? But if there's no um, uh eggs, fish, dairy, meat, honey on the ingredient list, I basically started to think, well, that means I may eat it. Even though just seeing that word milk may contain milk was usually enough for me to put it back, put the, put the package down and look for something else. 
And of course, the parent company of Popcorners is Pepsi. And that's certainly not a vegan company. And I don't really have any reason to be supporting Pepsi. But I did kind of like pop uh, Popcorners, kettle chips, and I kind of stopped worrying about it on that on that particular snack until this week when I wanted to double check whether my understanding of the may contain label was actually correct or whether maybe it had changed. I considered it simply an issue of allergenic potentiality rather than um, something that might contain an animal product. Well, when I went to the Popcorners website to look at the details and I read None of the flavors of Popcorners meet vegan standards, even though only four ingredients were on the label. Yellow corn, sunflower oil, cane sugar, sea salt. What to make of this? Because if there were milk in the formulation, the label would actually be required to list that. It would would have to say contains colon milk or any other of those eight. So my only guess, my only, my only way of understanding this is the issue must be the cane sugar. And that's something we haven't talked about here on the podcast. In the United States, refined sugar made from sugar cane is typically processed through burned cow bones. There's really no other way of saying it. They say cow bone char, and that's to filter the Uh, sugar and make it very white. And this process, uh, as far as I know, is no longer used in the EU, but it is still common in the United States. And so in the future, you, if you're listening to this in the future, this may be, this may be ancient and out of date, but as far as I know, in 2024, this is still common. So without calling or speaking to someone at Pepsi, I, you know, I'll never know what percentage of sugar they use that is refined using bone char process. Maybe, maybe they refuse to use it most of the time, but they have to uh, have to imagine that at some point that some of that kind of sugar could get into the manufacturing process. I don't know. I don't know. But, and then also there's the question, am I interrupting myself? There's also the question, why is it even necessary to have pure white sugar in the recipe for kettle corn flavor popcorners. But anyway, where I've been occasionally suspicious that there's been milk in those chips that may contain milk on the label had me thinking, what about milk? All along, it has probably been the sugar that made the product not really vegan. So, so kids, One of my goals this year on the podcast has been to let you know where I am continuing to learn lots of new things, where I run into issues in my vegan practice, and how I go about making decisions when there doesn't seem to be a great answer or a clear answer or an answer to be made in the moment. And even after almost nine years, there are different issues that come up for me, and I want to be as transparent as possible. And the issue of sugar has not been one that I have focused on. In the U.S., my understanding is that raw, unrefined sugars and beet sugars do not have this process of using bone char. And uh, that's what we use at home. We use organic, unrefined sugars and uh, sometimes coconut sugar. We use different sugars. And as far as I know, none of those have this um, rely on this process of of being filtered through cow bone char. Except, except when I make the nectar for the hummingbird feeders. So the hummingbird nectar, I have always read to use only refined cane sugar in the nectar because supposedly the brown traces, any brownness of that molasses left in the sugar contains iron, which is of course fine for humans, but not good, apparently, according to everything I read, for hummingbirds. But in the course of researching this episode, 
I see that the perennial advice to use fully refined cane sugar and not use the organic or unrefined or beet sugars may not be accurate anymore. And apparently that information was based on a report in the past from a zoo that was caring for hummingbirds. And it changed the formulation resulting in, um, in, in the medication it was giving those hummingbirds and the food it was giving. It, it resulted in some birds suffering iron poisoning. So, so. You know, you do you, my veggie bestie. But if you're still trying to move away from eating chickens and cows or eggs and milk, this information may be so far down your list of priorities. And if you're someone who never eats packaged or processed foods, or for that matter, feeds her hummingbirds, (laughs) you are probably not even buying cheap refined sugar or eating it. And if you're eating foods with sugar, whether homemade or commercial, you may want to look further into the sugars that are used and that are available to you. But in my case, if you're like me and you're committed to having nectar for these beautiful ruby-throated hummingbirds that right this minute, mid-April, they are winging their way towards me in New England. And they'll stay here, and I will love them for the next four or five months. I will be looking further now into the safety of using organic sugar. Because that label, organic sugar, apparently legally means that the sugars are not filtered through burned cow bones. Okay? I know. Oprah isn't on TV anymore. But even before Oprah, there was a guy named Phil Donahue who who was the daytime talk show host. And his catchphrase when tensions would run high on his show was, we're here to learn. And we are. We're here to learn. I am. I'm here to learn. And when I know better, I try to do better. And I think it's also important to remember the information you have will always change. There will always be more distinctions and context. There will be more to know. But as I said at the top of the episode, please do not let the details and the questions about small things distract you from the choices you can make today. It's pretty easy to know most of the time if you're eating meat or fish or dairy or eggs. Just looking for those obvious situations has such an impact. It's such a positive impact and it will impact the industrial animal agriculture in this country. It will impact your family's health and the environment. And as you learn more, You can take on more. And I don't think any of us is ever finished with that. In a good way. So, please, please don't let anything we talked about today, please don't let what there is still to know or learn discourage you in any way. And maybe even, maybe it's good to know that someone who thinks about these things a whole lot, myself, there's always more that I can be focused on. There are always distinctions I can pay more attention to. Okay, kids. Okay. I would love to hear from you if there are some things you've learned or how you learned them that made your vegan or plant-based practice evolve in some way. Typically, I think we, um, we plateau, you know, we've got something dialed in, we plateau, and then we're faced with like, oh, I had no idea, or I kind of did know, but I wasn't paying any attention to it. And then we have a new learning curve. So I'd love to hear what some of those those changes have been for you. But in the meantime, you know, just remember, veg your best. Veg Your Best podcast production, music, and editing by Charlie Weinshank. Thanks, Charlie. Before you go, it would mean so much to me and the Veg Your Best team if you would hit subscribe, leave us a five-star review, or share with someone you think might be interested. Something about algorithms, it helps bump us up a little in the rankings, and that's the best way to help others find the podcast and for us to find our audience. So, until next week, make it easy and veg your best.